Uh, thanks, Brian. I, I want to uh, thank you guys for letting me uh, serve as faculty. We have some uh, interesting topics to go over, so I'll just jump right into it with a question. Uh, so you should be seeing here, the 62-year-old man is scheduled for total knee arthroplasty. In his preoperative office visit, he asked questions about different tibial components. Uh, and you tell him that compared uh, with the tibial component in figure A, and I'll show you these, uh, the tibial component shown in figure B, and there's our choices, less expensive, greater durability, greater injury stability, uh, provides improved short-term functional status, but no long-term functional status, and associated with fewer adverse effects, uh, events, excuse me, because of easier implantation. So here are your, here are your pictures coming up. Of course, what you'll see is a modular uh, cemented prosthesis there on the right, and uh, what appears to be an all polyethylene tibia uh, with a uh, CR type femur, uh, and that's the comparison. So as we move forward here, the answer, uh, as you see here, is uh, less expensive. Uh, this is the answer looking at this uh, uh, all polyethylene liner. Um, and again, remember light blue are things we think are important. Uh, and as we go through, I'll keep highlighting what green and the darker blue means. Um, as we talk about TK prosthesis design, uh, we'll talk about a lot of different sort of design issues, and I'll try to keep this simple, uh, but where there certainly are unconstrained uh, designs to consider, uh, posterior cruciate retaining or CR, or posterior cruciate substituting, PS, and we'll even talk about some constrained options because they come up in a couple of the questions, um, and certainly we're going to touch on fixed and mobile bearing. Uh, a little bit about history, you know, the idea here, of course, was this was an effort to, uh, uh, or at first, was an interpositional type arthroplasty using soft tissue uh, to uh, reconstruct the articular surfaces. Uh, the actual first sort of metal prosthesis designed, uh, which was a hinge, was a Waldius in the 1950s. Um, things progressed from there in 58, McIntosh and McKeever inter introduced acrylic tibial plateau prosthesis to correct deformity. And the Gunston uh, first inter uh, introduced a sort of a bicondylar surface cemented arthroplasty of the knee joint in the 60s. Um, Quepar, uh, there was a new, newer hinged uh, design developed in 1970 uh, based earlier on the earlier Waldius design that allowed for increased motion and took less bone. And certainly things jumped forward significantly in 73 uh, with the development of the total condylar prosthesis which again was the first one to resurface all three compartments. This is a PCL sacrificing implant. Um, and uh, important to point out uh, what the PCA, what this process has started to allow us to achieve is similar rollback. We've highlighted similar rollback there as a sort of a light blue, so we think that that's important. Um, and uh, the definition of that, of course, as most of you would know, is posterior translation of the femur as you go into higher flexion. We've got this located here as green. We think the importance that it improves uh, quadricep, quadricep function and range of knee flexion uh, by preventing posterior impingement during deep flexion as the femur rolls back over. And we all know that certainly this is allowed in the native knee by the way the PCL and the ACL work together. So I think again, we've got that highlighted. This is our first green highlight where we're identifying this is something you might want to keep your eyes open for. Um, the design implications uh, with both the PCL retaining and PCL substituting designs allowing for uh, femoral rollback or such as this. If you think about it in the PCL retaining, the native PCL is going to be what sort of helps promote posterior displacement of the femoral condyles, much like you get in a native knee. The PCL is substituting. Uh, it's a little bit different. It's going to use the post, right? The tibial post contacts the cam, the femoral cam, and that's what gives you your posterior displacement of the femur. So, if we talk about constraints, uh, the definition would be the ability of a prosthesis to give you varus valgus and also flexion extension and stability in the face of ligament, ligamentous laxity or bone loss. That's what's going to sort of increase the challenge for constraint. Uh, the importance uh, in the setting of ligamentous laxity or severe bone loss, a standard cruciate retaining or posterior uh, stabilized implants may not be enough. And there's some questions that come up here uh, shortly where it sort of asks you about implant design, and we'll get to those because uh, it's important to consider what you need for constraint. And, and we're going to touch on some of those things that direct you in moving up the constraint ladder, if you will. So here is that order. You know, the least constrained going to most constrained is going to be cruciate retaining to a PS with cruciate substitution, a varus, val a varus valgus constraint. There's a lot of different terminologies for that. But again, this varus valgus constraint that's non-hinged. That's uh, sort of one, one rung below 
a true hinged knee implant or rotating hinge type device. So it's probably worthwhile understanding that sort of uh, uh, ladder, if you will, of increased constraint. Modularity, uh, important, I think a couple concepts that come up here, but it's the ability to augment a standard prosthesis, usually for soft tissue issues or bone loss. Um, and really where it comes up to first sort of start thinking about it is using a modular tibial base plate with a polyethylene insert as opposed to an all poly type insert, like we saw in that first question. Uh, there is certainly an increased cost with this that we've seen over the years, um, and probably has an equivalent rate of aseptic loosening, depending on what references you look at. Uh, compared with all polyethylene tibia. I uh, think you need to understand uh, metal augmentation for bone loss and certainly the ability to use modular thermals, uh, thermal and tibial stems. Um, again, touching back on this issue about modularity, uh, particularly as it pertains to the polyethylene liner and the tibial base plate and the modularity provided there, uh, the abilities is you can make, uh, as we all know, sort of an adjustment intraoperatively and uh, pick the polyethylene thickness that's most idealized after you've implanted the rest of the device for the actual metal implants. The disadvantages is the concern over increased rates of osteolysis. Um, and the, obviously we're concerned about that coming from backside polyethylene wear, perhaps for, because of micromotion between the tibial base plate. Again, that's obviously not present in an all polyethylene uh, uh, tibial component or non-modular tibial component. So here's the next question, uh, sort of moving on here. We got this uh, question about a posterior cruciate retaining total knee arthroplasty is contraindicated in all of the following patients except. And so what you're supposed to be able to pick out here is, you know, who, who, which of the folks is this going to be okay for? The, the options here are severe rheumatoid arthritis, 52-year-old patient, 73-year-old with post-traumatic arthritis of knee and prior patelectomy. That's an important one to remember about patelectomy. 67-year-old with degenerative arthritis, 10-degree valgus deformity, 55-year-old uh, male, post-traumatic arthritis, 20, uh, 20 uh, years after a bicruciate ligament uh, rupture, so the ACL and PCL are out. And then you've got the chronic history of steroid treatment uh, in a patient with uh, lupus and an arthritic knee. And, and basically, this is, a, this is sort of the clue that probably the only case you're going to want to consider uh, taking this uh, on, mean trying to uh, spare the cruciate, uh, would be the, uh, the uh, male patient, uh, degenerative arthritis, so non-inflammatory arthritis, and it's really just got a fairly reasonable frontal plane deformity, uh, and that's the patient you can go after. You don't, you got to stay away from that patelectomy patient. That's going to be PS design, and certainly if both the ligaments are out, you can't go with the you should approach. All right, CR design, uh, minimally constrained prosthesis. Obviously, got to have the PCO in place. Uh, there are some suggestions about indications, as you see just from the question we did. So in saying a valgus deformity less than 15 degrees is okay, varus less than 10. Uh, there may be some folks that would stretch this, but keep in mind, got to have the ACL intact. Probably your lesser deformities, uh, depending on your comfort with that approach. Uh, the CR design is not going to show a box in the central portion of the thermal component as a PS knee has. It's sort of some straightforward stuff about radiographic identification. I would point out that obviously you could use a, uh, a ultra congruent or sort of a uh, anterior stabilized type polyethylene liner. We don't have anything on the slides in that, but certainly you might want to be able to understand that a CR femur could mate with that type of liner with the uh, cruciate being out. Um, the advantages of a CR design, you, you're not going to have uh, cam post impingement and that risk of dislocation or just impingement and poly wear that can occur with that, with that design. Uh, whether or not you get more uh, sort of normal kinematics is, I think, debated. Uh, but uh, with the PCL intact, it certainly has been purported that there's improved proprioception. reception. Disadvantages, if it's too tight, uh, that can cause issues with polyethylene wear, and if it, if it ruptures late, that may set you up in a situation where the patient needs reoperation. Um, here's our next question. Range of knee mobility after total knee replacement is multifactorial and dependent upon implant design, surgeon implantation accuracy, and patient-specific variable. What total knee implant design associated with the most knee flexion after total knee replacement? You have here going, we have a high conforming articular geometry, a high flexion thermal component design manufactured to allow the most knee flexion, posterior cruciate stabilized implant with or without higher flexion manufacturing modification, and a posterior cruciate retaining design with a mobile bearing custom implanted based on CT scan data. Probably some, some sort of a, a couple options in there to throw you off. Really, if you think about this, what the data would show is that it's going to be a posterior cruciate stabilized implant with or without any special modification 
uh, from the standpoint of the, ma the manufacturing uh, as it pertains to higher flexion. So that's just remembering where you're going to get a higher, better range of motion uh, without sort of any of these changes uh, from the standpoint of actual design of the implant. Okay, PS design. Uh, slightly more constrained prosthesis. You got to get rid of the PCL. Uh, and the femoral component, as we touched on already, is going to have a cam that engages with the post. And you have a little bit more higher congruency, sort of A to P. And that's why you refer to these as more highly dished. Indications, we talked about previous patellectomy in that previous question. And we want to point out um, that it reduces risk of potential anterior posterior instability if the instinctual mechanism is weak. So that's one of these ones we've identified as potential target for the MOC exam. Uh, it's a great option, certainly um, in the... Uh, uh, inflammatory arthritis population because of concerns of loss of the PCL late, uh, and certainly if the PCL is not there. Radiographs, we touched on this when I showed you the CR design type thing. Remember, there's going to be a box. There's different variability in how sort of high or deep these boxes are, but that's going to give you a clue on a radiograph if that's where they're trying to take you with a question. Advantages, eager, eager, easier to balance uh, with the absent PCL because you don't have to worry about balancing the PCL itself or recessing the PCL. There's this arguable point about more range of motion, as we touched on already, and potentially easier surgical exposure, particularly for tibial, tibial work, because you uh, don't have to sacrifice the uh, PCL. Or you do get to sacrifice the PCL. Here's the disadvantages. Got to remember about cam jump, risk of that femur coming over the post, and if the uh, flexion gap is uh, too loose, or certainly in hyperextension, uh, that can occur as well, depending on what's going on with the extension gap. Uh, closed reduction is going to be your first realm of treatment, a round of treatment. Uh, certainly, if um, you have to do something uh, because you have recurrence or there's an issue with still sort of perceived instability, that's going to potentially lead to a revision. So it has to be considered with these processes. Don't forget um, that you can get polyethylene wear um, related to impingement. Uh, if you get hyperextension and post impingement, the box, the top of the box is hitting against the post. Uh, that's an issue potentially with some knee designs and certainly patellar clunk. Particularly, uh, there's some concern about basically, basically the size of the box or the fact there's a box there at all where you get that scar nodule above the uh, patella itself, which can cause mechanical uh, symptoms, and uh, this can often be addressed arthroscopically. Um, uh, certainly want to be aware of that as sort of downside uh, uh, risk. Um, additional bone is often cut from the distal femur to balance the extension gap because your flexion gap gets larger when you take the PCL. So that's something you may have to do to keep up. Here's the next question. An obese patient underwent a, a posterior cruciate ligament retaining knee arthroplasty. It's failed. Patient's being considered for revision. Patient also has MCL out. So the medial collateral ligament is deficient. And if you're thinking about a knee prosthesis, what features are considered to be essential? So we're saying no MCL here. You got to have, they're opposing ability to re remain, uh, retain PCL. Uh, the next sort of one, constraint mechanism for resist varus valgus loads. Want something that resists rotational load, something that allows similar rollback, and then high conformity is discussed. What you really want to be concerned about the MCL out is a constraint mechanism that re, uh, resists various valgus loads. You've got to have something that's going to replace the deficient MCL, uh, and that's critical in that type of case. And so um, a constrained non-hinge design would be one that is not a true hinge with that, so there's no axial uh, that uh, links, if you will, or makes the femoral and tibial components relate together like a door hinge. It has a larger tibial post with a deeper femoral box and usually less space available for the post within the box. And its, it's idea is to allow varus valgus and rotational stability. Constrained uh, non-hinge design indications, LCL attenuation or MCL attenuation or deficiency, flexion ga gap laxity because the post in, is higher and the box is deeper, and certainly considerations in neuropathic, neuropathic arthropathy uh, uh, with moderate bone loss. You'll see some questions come up here, some radiographs. Just remember that, that non-hinge design is not going to show a true hinge or bolt across the femur. It may show metal reinforcement within the post, and that's a tip-off. That that's what you're, you're dealing with. Um, the advantages, more stability. If there's uh, soft tissue issues, distal, obviously di the disadvantage is it requires more bone resection for this larger box. And there's concern as you increase constraint, that's going to transfer more stress to the implants. Uh, and that can be an issue with regard to loosening of implants. Our next question, 50-year-old man. He's a patient with uh, diabetes, end-stage renal disease. He's got instability after a total knee. We've got some radiographs we're going to look at. He's got a large effusion, maltracting patella, extensor lag, medial instability, gross laxity, 
Uh, it was an uncomplicated procedure using a posterior stabilized prosthesis with tibial augments and uncemented, uh, in, uh, and uncemented intramedullary rods in both the femur and the tibia. And what they're proposing is, how could you have avoided this? We're going to look at these uh, images. Here was sort of this challenging knee here that uh, where this was taken on. Uh, sorry, I think I'm going to lost. Yeah, sorry, here we go. So uh, where they're saying you could have, this thing obviously had a sort of a per fairly catastrophic failure. Uh, and and what, you're, what you're dealing with here in this diabetic patients where you probably have some Charcot type issues. This is one where even though this was sort of a primary knee issue, you probably, or at least start off as a primary knee case, this is one where you probably should have jumped right to a hinge. I think that's an important thing to consider in some of these cases they're showing you. Constrained hinge design. So here we are at the top of the ladder for constraint. Uh, it's our most constrained prosthesis. It's linked, again, remember femur linked to tibia. There's a rotation around a yoke in the tibial platform, and it uh, decreases the overall level constraint if it's a rotating platform type uh, hinge. And this is the one you're going to use where there's this globus, globus, uh, global ligamentous deficiency, hyperextension instability in some of these uh, severe cases as they're indicated here. Uh, tumor cases for sure, distal femoral replacement, proximal tibial replacement. And massive bone loss again in that neuropathic type joint. I think we've got another question coming up that highlights that. The advantage is, is it can have uh, you know, the highest level of stability in the face of bony uh, and soft tissue loss, particularly ligamentous uh, loss, medial and collateral ligaments. Disadvantages again comes up this aseptic loosening again, increased constraint, increased stress to the cement uh, uh, implant bone interface, and you got to take out a lot of bone to get these implants into position. So here's another question. And we're talking about um, rates of loosening secondary to over constraint, and they're asking which design here. So we've got some pictures coming up. And as you can see, we've got uh, what looks to be just a PS type knee cemented. Uh, we've got a patellofemoral orthoplasty. We've got what looks to be uh, hinged, uh, hinged uh, type prosthesis. We've got a uh, partial uh, medial unicompartmental orthoplasty and a cementless knee uh, that appears to be, I can't, we can't tell what type of sort of. Uh, PCL uh, performance has been uh, done there, uh, but the obvious question here, obvious answer here is going to be C. Uh, it's a Waldius hinge, total knee prosthesis design, and uh, data showing increased rates of aseptic loosening because of that increased constraint. So that's something probably highly testable. What about mobile bearing designs? As we move along here, polyethylene rotates within the tibial base plate without a locking mechanism. Uh, with most designs, PCL is removed at the time of surgery. Um, the advantage is, is that it can uh, theoretically reduce polyethylene wear, and that has to do with what it does to um, contact uh, area uh, stresses uh, below the base plate, uh, certainly on the tibial side. And I think there is some literature out there to support this idea uh, because you are sort of trying to take pressure off because the, the poly bearing gets to turn. There are some disadvantages. Bearing spin out has been described but, uh, primarily in older designs, and that's something you would expect if the flexion gap's been uh, treated in a way that you're too, too loose. Uh, the tibia, tibia rotates behind the femur, you know, and that's the one we're going to attempt to close reduction at first, but may require revision to formalize the, uh, and stabilize the uh, flexion and extension gaps. What about all polyethylene? I think this is something we want to be mindful of. We've got this reference here, um, certainly um, about uh, comparison, and there's numerous studies that compare these uh, all polyethylene designs to um, modular, but we touched on some modular issues. You know, because of the modularity, there have been concerns about rates of osteolysis. So if it's non-modular and all polyethylene, there may be that price advantage with decreased rates of osteolysis. You, do, you lose that flexibility intraoperatively. So clearly, you're not going to have that uh, available if you go to that approach. So here's the 67-year-old obese diabetic woman. Uh, after bone resection, the PCL retaining trial implants placed at full extension, 30 degrees of flexion, 90 degrees of flexion. It's tight laterally, loose medially. They do more releases, a larger polyethylene trial is placed, still medial laxity. It's asking you, what are you going to do now? Uh, and I think uh, you've got options here about what you're going to do as you've sort of continued to fight uh, getting stability in this knee. And what's proposed in this answer, which was not a straightforward knee by any, any point, it looks like we've got potentially another sort of Charcot uh, situation in this uh, diabetic patient, bone loss. Uh, and this is going to be a convert to increased constraint. This is a Charcot arthritic knee. Dad valgus, this is one where most folks are going to have to ramp up to a constrained design uh, to sort of make sure this is something that's going to last for this patient. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like. We'd love to hear your thoughts and what you'd like to see next in the comments.
Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media.